All right, guys, and today we have an episode on all things guardrail and handrail. So this isn't meant to kind of walk you through every possible setting of every possible different configuration of rally. What it's really meant to do is accelerate your thought process and your modeling process to get those railings in in the first place. We give you some tips about how to lay out your points, how to do those returns, and how to make everything a little bit easier. All that today and a little bit more on the Steel Forum. All right, so one of the things that I found uh, while we've been doing a lot of these videos is that despite the fact that we think the input on something is simple and that the way we do it is the logical way that everybody would do it that way, we have found some tips and tricks over the time. And one of the areas that we found a lot of those um, that knowing it right, up the, uh, right off the bat makes things a lot easier and to, to do it right the first time as opposed to what I like to do is kind of slam it in and then tweak it. Uh, it, this this process does go a lot faster is for putting guardrails and handrails in so hopefully Matt here can educate both me and our viewers at home on how to do this as quickly and efficiently as possible how's it going Matt it's going all right man it's going all right We're, uh, getting close into deer season so I'm kind of excited about that all right sure I'm, uh, I'm always excited for the jerky that you bring me so not too excited for the, you know, regular annual slowdown, but we haven't seen that coming at all. Okay, so uh, let me, you want to start with like some stair rails or do you want to just start with some, some flat rails? I think we should start with uh, stair rails. Start with stair rails? Okay. Yeah. So let me just set up a quick stair because this was our testing to determine that, look at that, you really can put in plate for stringers. All right, so I know at least a couple of you out there are going, what the heck is an MC12 by 14.3? A lot of you might not know that this was a new shape introduced a couple years back. It's basically in MC12.10.6 on steroids, it's got that wider flange, which makes it a lot easier to make the calculations for the railings too. Uh, you can support fully support a inch and a half standard pipe, which as you probably know, is kind of what you need at four feet on center. Uh, we usually actually use schedule 80 pipe at four feet on center these days to make sure that you're getting those 300 pounds of point load at any point along the rail that is so frequently required. So you don't have to jump up to that C12 by 20.7 now. You've got this MC12 by 14.3, which is kind of the best of both worlds. So take me through, what are the, the lines that you're getting? What are important here? So when I lay out the stair, typically what I want to do is I want to have that uh, railing <clears throat> centered on the flange. So just because I know the width of this flange for the stringer, I am laying out a line to the inside of it, and then I'm going to offset to the center point. So that's to get your post centered, because the member line is going to be the center of the rail. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Now, when I go to put this in, uh, I, we always detail our stairs, or our railings rather, we always detail our railings with the walk side as the near side. So I want to make sure that I am getting into a section view facing that correct direction. So the walk side will be closer to me as I'm plugging this in. Yeah, and that's good practice in general. Uh, there are a lot of mistakes that can happen when fabricating a rail if you've got that walk side to the far side. Not to mention, it's exceptionally hard to lay out a railing that is sitting on a handrail. So when it's coming towards you, when that you know those little round bar, uh, bent round bars that support your handrail are sticking out, you don't have to worry about something laying flat against the table. You can lay your rail flat, weld it in place, and easy peasy. It's just, there's no way to make this stair right because it's at a 45, but I just can't stand having that stuff hanging off the bottom and I'm making it worse. Yeah, why don't you just stretch it out like a good boy? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, I suppose. And now oh, we wait. Let's see. And now we wait. Q, speed up, sped up sequence. Prepare to fast forward. Preparing to fast forward. Fast forward. Fast forwarding, sir. All right, so you've got your center of rails. What's next? 
Okay, so now I want to make sure that I'm getting into section view by using control S to cut my section. And I'm just following the line of that center of the flange, looking in the direction so that I am facing the near side or the walk side of that rail. Yeah, when you when you lay out a railing, when you insert it, you always want to insert it with the, the walk side coming towards you. It makes layout a lot easier to not have to uh, flip your head around or whatever else if you're that fabricator, because those round bar or whatever else type of brackets you've got sticking out would actually sit up against the table. Uh, so having the walk side come towards you makes checking more easy and consistent, uh, and it also makes that layout and fabrication easier. Your fabricator will thank you for it. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out just some of the pertinent information. One would be where the nosing line hits my walk levels at both top and bottom. Sure. And then I'm going to kick out one foot on either side from there because that's where I'm going to end my posts or my returns, as it were. Now, when you're laying out a stair, there's up to three sections that you can have. The main section, the left return, and the right return. And how you're trying to get that stair to lay out is going to determine where you pick for your main return and if, if you have a left or right return and how you're going to frame those out. Yeah, and this is something that I've always hated about handrails, and it's not because the tool is bad, it's because I'm bad. Uh, uh, this, you know, advanced preparation and really thinking out what you're going to do before you get the member ad in there and before you see any of that graphical railing is super important to being successful and efficient in putting these in. Definitely. Now... Uh, the first point that it's going to ask me for is the left end. Now, this is not going to be necessarily the left end of the entire rail. It's the left end of the main section. So because I'm going to have this break horizontally at top and bottom, my left end will actually be right here. And then I'm going to follow along the nosing line and pick my top point for the right end. And now it's going to ask me for a left return. So that's based off from this point. How far do you want that? I'm going to go one foot. And then the right end return is the same idea, but coming from the right end, following the walk line or the floor, and then it's going to set up the member. Now, I don't want a toe plate anywhere, so I'm going to turn that off. We want that walk side to be near side. And in this case, I'm going to return to post at both ends initially. What we're going to do when we get done with this is we're going to start modifying this, and I'll show you how to set this up so it's just a wall rail but we'll build it backwards to that point from here. Okay. Okay, so we are going to leave these as standard inch and a half pipes, and we're gonna add a grab bar. So if I go down to the grab bar, you'll see one thing you don't notice here is a grab bar size. They give you the mid rail, the post, and the top rail, but no grab bar. You've actually gotta to go to the grab bar tab in order to get that size if you wanted to make it something different. Yeah. And in this video, we're not going to take you through all the different options for mesh or different styles of railings. You can kind of play with that. The idea with this one is to efficiently add a railing. That's what this one is about. Okay, so one of the other things that you're going to notice here is you get different spacing mechanisms for each of these sections and different connection types. You can manipulate these based on whatever it is you want to do for that section. So if you want to have base plates because you're going to be mounting these bolting down to a stair stringer at the main section and then go plain end at the returns because you're going to be anchoring that into concrete, you can do that and differentiate between those different connections. Okay. So in our case, we are going to set this up as a base plate on the main section then at the left return, we are going to go plain end because we're going to sink that into some concrete as a post. And then we will stick with the base plate for the other return. And I'm not going to mess with these post spacings just yet. I'm going to teach you how to do that in a little bit better way. But let's see what the system designs to start with. And the other thing I always do when I get started in this is I go right to the ends tab and I start changing everything to miter if that's what my customer prefers, which most of our customers prefer to see miters on everything. I would say it's about 50-50. About and again, we're not digging deep into all the base plate conditions. We're not going to go through all that. We kind of expect as SDS2 users that you can find that those, those different settings and play with them. Uh, what is important to note is that 
the, the, the left and the right returns, those returns, you have to stop this rail whenever you want it to change conditions. So if it's going to level out, if it's going to turn a corner, anything like that, that's where your return comes in, uh, is, is immediately at that point. Correct. Now, one of the things that we see a lot is our main section tends to fall on the stringer. And when you've got a base plate, it's going to provide centered up holes that are a little bit too tight. So that tends to not go our way. So one of the things you'll want to do is adjust your center to center, and then you'll want to create an offset base plate. But remember, the nice thing is you get to set this up individually between the main section and each of the returns. So you can have centered up holes when it's level and then offset ones when it's not. Okay, now the reason that that's not adding the bolts is quite simply because I did not put in the vertical distance to the connection, which is another thing I'm going to be talking about. So another thing you want to do is get your uh, construction lines for the material that you're actually mounting to and measure that vertical distance. So we've got inch and three quarters. So when I go back in and edit this, it's top of support distance. That's where I'm going to put in my inch and three quarters under the main section. Now the floor thickness, this has to do with offsetting where the member line is going to occur. Generally, I put everything in at the walk line and at the floor level. So my floor thickness is typically already set to zero. The only place that you're going to put that in as something with a positive value would be if you are anchoring to a beam and then you need to account for the thickness of a slab going up above that beam. Hmm. Okay. And then when you do that and, and you provide top of rail, is top of railing increased by the distance, that, that floor thickness? Yes, the floor thickness will increase the top of rail height from where you initially draw it, whereas top of connection or top of support will not. All right. That's an important That just trims the bottom. So now I've got another item over here because I've got my return, which should be four inches, and it is, so I need to set that one up as well. So my right return, I need a top of support there for four. And I just happened to notice, it looks like I've missed a few miters, so I've got kind of a back and forth on this. There we go. And lastly, because I set these up to return to post, I just want my grab bar to also miter when it returns. Now I have a very simple handrail. Okay, now what happens when you want a very specific spacing? Okay, we see this a lot where we need to have a very exacting spacing and SDS will do an auto spacing, which is great, but it doesn't account for that spacing over the whole member. It accounts for it within each section. So you get a little bit where it's off now let's let's talk about that parametric that you're using real quick. Uh, the cons okay. line linear array. That's in the distributed folder under the macros under by default. Correct. Okay. Yes, we we have that added as a launcher. But yes, that is where you can find that is um, macro examples distributed BV and then it's cons linear array or cons array linear. I believe it's called. Yeah. Absolutely can't live without that one. That's that's a must have for. And any detail. If you need more information on that, we do have a previous video about setting up your launchers. This buttons are way easier than, you know, launch parametric and then browsing to a whole bit. <laughs> yes. Let's make sure I've got everything cleared off. Okay, max spacing at four feet. There we go. Now I can see what I'm doing. So now what I want is three posts to occur at these very specific points. Now, just to show you what I'm talking about when I say the SDS doesn't quite do this right, let's say I just go to auto and I set this to be four feet. Sure. Okay. So it's giving me a max spacing of four feet between this break and this break. Okay. I need it to occur from the end. So because I want to include that as well, that's why I want to set this up. So if, you're, if your so, end was a post, if your first post was at zero, you'd be fine. Correct. 
So it works great on flat rails a lot better. Generally, when it's just a single run and there's no returns, then it pretty much does the job. But in this case, on stairs, it, it tends to fall short. But I find you've got other options, the semi-auto and the semi-user. But for me, user is the way to go. And you can just pick the number of posts that you want, and then you click locate. And now you can just click the points where you want these posts to occur. Now, is it important that you click them along the nosing line? Yes. And you'll see I missed that one, and it did follow it up. So the great thing is if you make a mistake, just click locate again, and you can just do it again. All right. There we go. Awesome. That's pretty simple. So how do we change the, the, the end conditions? Okay. So at the end conditions, you can do several different things. Let's say you don't need to actually run this into a post. Let's say you just want to put in a P end. So now all I have to do is go in and under the left end, it's set to return and then the left return end is set to post. I'm going to change that to be a P end. And now what I'll get is this loops back under itself to the bottom mid rail, which that's very important to remember. It's the bottom mid rail. So if you have multiples, that's where it's going to go. And then it will return back up that way. Now, why did it use an elbow there? It, it's going to default to elbows for everything. So because it suddenly has that new condition, it's just going to set that as an elbow. I see. Now, okay, so now I've got the situation. Let's say I, I can no longer get away with having, you know, this distance over to the post. So now I want to set this up a little bit differently. So I'm going to go ahead and get that line here. And let's say one foot six, carry me to there. And I just want to move that down a bit. And I'm going to respace it, but I'm going to use kind of the same idea. So I'll lay this back out. And now I'll relocate these. Again, making sure to click points that are along the nosing line. Correct. And now I've reordered them a little bit, and now I've got that extra distance of support down at the bottom. Awesome. So now I can't add additional returns, right? I have one top and one bottom, that's it. Correct. You get one top and one, one left end, one right end is your maximum. All right. So let's take a break for a minute. We'll set up a uh, switchback stair with the, the transitions in the middle, and we'll take you through one of those. Sounds good. All right. And presto changeo, we have a switchback stair with some relics. Now, we're not just going to walk away with you and, you know, pull a SDS2 webinar thing where everything's just done and looks beautiful. We'll take you through it. So here we go. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is lay out the center lines for my actual grab bars. And then I'm going to cut myself into a section view along that center line of the first one. Again, remembering that you're always looking toward with the walk side toward you. Correct. Okay, now I'm just going to double check my horizontal distance center to center is three and a half. So that's how far out I want to come to get to my end point. Okay, now right at this line, right at the nosing line, that's where I want to break this to begin with. Okay, so I need to actually run up my grab bar until the top of that grab bar hits that point. So my first step is going to be to just take a quick measurement and determine what that distance is. I've got 9 sixteenths. So now I'm going to edit this rail and I'm going to set under ends, setback. And now I've got that up where I need it. Now, can you just and take a minute? Uh, I just want to talk to some of the maybe less experienced stair details here. Can you zoom out a touch? And can you add in the construction lines to that far side stair? Or just actually go solid transparent. That'll, that'll show it well enough. There you go. All right. So you'll notice with this stair, we're set up so that the walk lines of the two stairs, the nosing lines, intersect just about at each other. 
Well, a lot of uh, new architects or unthinking architects or experienced architects who just don't know better will do is they'll align the stair one nosing too close to each other. So they'll show that first nosing line lining up with the tread line of the second one. So there's this big step down. Okay. In this one, you can see that this the, the riser has enough time to get down so that the slope of these two about meets at that landing line, as opposed to that first riser line being offset 11 inches, which is frequently shown on the contract drawings. Why this is important is that if you don't do this, if you don't offset these stairs, you'll get a return that looks ridiculous because it has to slope so far down, it has to change elevation so quickly that you just can't make it work out. So if you get into a situation and for whatever reason you're, you're looking at your railings and the return turns out to be, you know, look really stupid, it's because the architect was stupid and didn't lay out his nosing correctly. The right. best thing to do right then is to stop, issue an RFI, explain the story about why it's important to line up these nosing lines and how it ends up in a much cleaner, refined detail. If for whatever reason you end up having to do a ridiculous return, fine, you got to do it. But start with that RFI, make your job easier, make a better product in the end. So. Right. And just to kind of visually show what you were talking about, I've moved this stair and railing over 11 inches to roughly line up these nosings. So now you see how your grab bar is elevated when it gets to that break point. But you're still going to have to return back at yourself in order to make this run. And that's where you have to put that descent in is you either have to drop it straight down or you're going to have to put in a kind of a sloping transition across the two. Yeah, and a little and bit of a slope is, is kind of normal. Sometimes you got to get there. Um, but if especially if you have a narrow well, which is the distance in between the stringers, uh, you don't have time to make that look good or to make a smooth transition. You know, we should do, uh, we'll, we'll make this, but I can make a copy of it. We can do a, a fugly one just to show how to make that transition. Yeah, yeah, we should definitely do that. Fugly, by the way, being a uh, well-known, well-established industry term, spe Absolutely. specifically for dealing with those in the architectural trades. Okay. Okay, so I've got this laid out. It's going to break at the right spot now. Now what I want to do is lay out what are my horizontal lines going to look like and just begin laying this in. Okay, now this line is going to represent my center point, so I do want to show the outside radius. So I'm going to put in another negative offset there, and now I'm going to start putting in some of these materials. Now this you have to model in manually, right? This this cannot yes. be automated with returns. Now there was some talk a few years ago, uh, this is between the transition from 2017 to 2018. Uh, we were talking with Beimer or you know other folks at SDS2 about creating a component, parametric, something along those lines that would do this process of transitioning the rails automatically. That for whatever reason fell off the drawing board uh, so we're stuck, at least for the time being, at putting this in manually. Yes. Okay, so now that I've got this horizontal break, I'm going to cut another section, and I'm going to follow right down that center line. Now from here, because I've already got this horizontal piece in, I'm going to use that, and then I'm going to get my other construction lines here. This is going to be the center line that I want to follow. And the way that I like to lay this out, because we like to put our splices right in the middle, is I'll just put this in with an even spacing and just let it break it for me. I just want to take a moment here to mention to a lot of you users, you're thinking to yourselves, hey, you know, I can divide this two equal spaces equally. I don't need this parametric. It's, you know, too much of a pain to run. I highly, highly recommend that you actually get this stuff on your toolbar or on your shortcut menu. These little things 
that we do that take a couple of seconds here or there. Once you get these toolbars and these buttons ready and at your fingertips, you're going to be a much more productive and accurate detailer. So I just want to take a moment and mention that. Get that efficiency up. Make every dollar that you possibly can. And again, for anybody out there without kind of the field or the experience in putting in railings, what they're going to do is they're going to put up this railing on the what, what's on the right side of the screen. They'll put up the one on the left side of the screen, and then they'll mush these two together. Um, you can use a splice lock, which is a, a you know bought item, uh, or they can just butt weld it there. All right. Now my last move is going to be to get the section cut on the opposing rail. We'll move into that view next. And I'm just going to finish the job off here. Now, one thing that's important uh, that I, I noticed you didn't mention is to make sure that that rail coming down is going to have time to get down to its elevation before your return piece. Um, sometimes, again, with right. with funny layouts, you got to make sure you got to move that out a little bit. Um, the the return to get you to the elevation that you need right and and i've already laid this out in such a way that it was going to have that room but uh one of the things i want to point out here is you remember on the other side when we were on the ascending rail that we measured along the top to the break point yeah here we want to measure from the bottom to the break point because otherwise when you go to miter it you won't have enough left right you won't have enough material to actually get it done okay one thing to I'm note while well, you change these colors because I don't know how this stands out to you, but me being colorblind, I can't really tell where that line is. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to lay out my last horizontal piece. Now, why did you decide to go to the end instead of the center on that one? The outside edge? Yes. So you want to go to the outside edge because you're going to need to provide enough material to miter that with. So you're going to use the miter tool as opposed to just typing in a miter. Correct. And the benefit of that is if that piece, the return piece, is sloping a little bit, you don't have to figure out all that compound stuff. You can just use that miter tool and you'll get a nice result. Correct. Now, the way that we will lay these out is we will put all of this in and make sure we are 100% happy with the stair insofar as the stair can be designed within the member edit screen first. Because once we start making some of these miters, we are going to turn this stair graphical and we're going to be stuck with it. Yeah. And this is, a, you know, this isn't really SDS discussion so much as, as stair detailing discussion, but across the, the line, we today are seeing more and more, almost all of our detailers are submitting erection drawings uh, for approvals only, as opposed to providing all of the details for all this stuff. Because of situations like this, where railings, you know, doing all this work is extremely time consuming, um, and it's not that we don't have to do this work eventually, but if we can get those field measurements first and let the architect redesign the job on approval the first time, we can save not only ourselves, but our customers a lot of time and hassle. And if you are curious about that, like if you've been considering doing that, we highly recommend it. It is more and more standard across the industry, so don't let you know anybody tell you that nobody does it that way. People are doing it all across the country. Okay, so there we go. We've made our transition. All right, awesome. Uh, one of the one of the Im important things, code-wise, here is that that be a smooth and continuous piece, so that you know a, a person following that stair, their hand kind of travels all the way down that stair and into or around. Um, you know, if, it's not for when you can see; it's for when it's a smoke-filled room or if you happen to be disabled and you can't see. That's what that situation is. And, you know, I encourage modelers and detailers when they're working on railings uh, to kind of always consider that situation. This could be a life or death issue for somebody who's trying to get out of this building. So make, make sure that it's safe. One of the, the really interesting things, uh, soon we're going to start seeing a difference in the dimension from the guardrail to that handrail. Um, it is a difference between the NF, I think it's the NFPA, the, the fireman's code versus the IBC, um, that the, the firemen want a further distance. And the basic reason for it is that they're wearing big old honking gloves. 
and they need to be able to grab that handrail. And sometimes at the closer spacings, they can't grab it the way that they want to. So I encourage you all to kind of look into that and watch out for it. And when you see it, you can sound like you know what you're talking about when you tell them just why that's changing. All right, so the next thing that you always kind of need on these well rail or well stairs or switchback stairs, depending on who you talk to, uh, is a just a classic wall rail. Could you take us through doing one of those as quickly and painlessly as possible? Sure. So typically the way we wind up with a wall rail is we're going to have a quarter inch gap from the toe of the stringer to the face of the wall. We want to get that wall line located in our model. So we're going to get that construction line. And then as usual, we're going to cut our section view facing the walk side of the rail. And again, for you newer detailers, the reason for that quarter inch gap is, is twofold. One, it turns out that masons aren't very accurate and uh, a CMU wall is never, ever, ever as straight as you would like it to be. And the second is that your rollers aren't as re accurate as you would like it to be either. So your channel is going to be a little bit out of true. There's going to be a little sweep to it. So those two things are generally taken up in that quarter inch. Uh, sometimes it's asked for you to close that quarter inch. You could do that with just a simple piece of gauge plate or a flat bar welded on top. Okay, so once I've laid out the, the primary construction lines for the stair, and that's just following the nosing line and then my one foot offsets at each end, I'm just going to put in the stair rail as I usually would. Okay, and again, that's my along the nosing line. Your left return. My returns. And your right return. Okay, and now I'm going to make sure I have add grab bar only, but then I'm going to check, or I'm sorry, add grab bar, and then I'm going to check grab bar only. And, and turn off this PN stuff and just make sure it's all set to posts. What version added the grab bar only? Do you remember? I think grab bar only came in in 2018. I think you're right. I think it's fairly recent. I mean, not that 2018 at this point is fairly recent, but version-wise... Version wise, 2018's recent. Okay, and I'm going to set my return or my uh, grab bars to be returned to post, and then I'm going to turn off fit to post. Now, why is that? Now, the reason I'm going to do that is it's going to actually do the returns to the wall. Okay. But it's it's going to pretend that there's a post there, and I don't actually want there to be a post that it's going to trim it to. I want it to run it all the way to the wall, and then I want to be able to put in a setback to keep it shy of that wall. Okay. So I'll set this to half inch on each side. And just for the grins of it, I'm going to go into grab bar and we'll leave the supports on so you can see how these are located. But in the final product, we will turn these off. All right. So here you see we are, in fact, trimmed about a half inch clear of the wall because we've got about a quarter inch between the nosing, er, I'm sorry, to the stringer and then the additional quarter inch there to the face of the wall. So now all I'm going to do is cap this with a couple of round plates. I like to get all of my construction lines in in the first place so I can do this all in one shot. It's little things like that that make you so much better of a modeler than I ever can be because I don't do it regularly enough. That so you're not thinking about economy of commands. Right. So now I just have, rather than running each command twice, I'm going to run each command once. And now I'm done. And that's it. Short of putting your brackets on, that's a completed wall rail. Now let's talk a little bit about those brackets, uh, just so that we can uh, clarify if, if people have questions. So the, one of the most common brackets is the Wagner bracket. Uh, we have an assembly that we use for those that, that kind of makes it look good. One of the important things that I try to remember our, or remind our detailers of is to make sure when you put in those brackets, you also put in the field bolts that go along with them. A lot of times you end up forgetting those, and then your erector is a sad, sad person. And then they make... Sad is kind. Typically, I find angry is the way to go, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, while they're angry, they make us sad, I guess. Yeah. So... So now, is there any way that we can make those um, uh, railing supports be vertical instead of rotated? Yes. So under the supports, you can set orient relative to, and you can set it to either rail or post, and that is going to rotate that. 
The one thing to note, though, is when you set it to post, it will not actually trim it. So that material is just plowing into the railing. All right, and now I have to apologize to future me and take a brief break so I can let my stupid duck out. Sorry, future me. And you know what? It's going to drive me crazy if you don't actually put in those uh, grab bar. Ooh, I see the brackets yeah, get put in. you got to put them in. Got to put them in. Okay, so just to demonstrate then the way that we do the brackets, and it's entirely possible you're going to have to cut this out and we'll shoot it all over again because I'm not positive we have all of our assemblies in this job but the way ours is set up is you would surface onto the wall line so in this case we're going to cut that section again on the wall line again looking so that the walk side is toward you and then we would get the construction lines for the pipe itself from there, on our returns, we typically put these in at six inches inside from the ends. And then we'll do the ones along the slope as a little bit of a trick after. Of course, we don't have that assembly. Okay. So you have to pause the video for a moment while I get the assemblies. And we're back. Okay, so what we would do is add the assembly for our bracket, which for us is aligned at the face of the wall at the bottom of the rail. So when I pick this point, it's exactly where I want it. And because I've already laid out my construction lines, I can just repeat. And now those are done. Okay, now we want to get that center portion plugged in. I'm going to turn off the supports now because I don't actually want these to show up. And now we're going to rotate this to get it on the right view. This way I don't have to work out what that angle is. So that keyboard shortcut. And I believe this is set up in the system. This is not one we've done custom, but we use RV. Right, for rotate and we're view. going to pick two points along that bottom line. Left point, the first point you pick will be the left end. So when this rotates, I can just click OK with reasonable confidence that that's exactly what I wanted. Now I can lay this out. Okay, so based on that, we really just want this in the middle. So we'll go two equal spaces. And the assemblies are put in based on the rotation of your screen, not the rotation of the global coordinates. So now I've got that in right where I want it. And Kill if you ask lines. is real nice, we'll send you a model file with that uh, that the wagon assembly. bracket in it. But in exchange, you got to put a comment actually on the YouTube channel, not in an email. We get so many comments by email. It's crazy. I mean, not that it's bad. We love to get emails too, but. Got to help out that YouTube algorithm. Well, yeah, that helps. <laughs> and there we go. There's a completed wall rail. Um, could you take us through one of the rails that doesn't return just straight but actually turns 90 degrees or some other dimension? Sure. So you're talking when the nosing lines are lined up and you've got this grief going on where you have no, to no, descend No, like one that, that reaches the top of the stair and returns along the, the you know, landing or something like that. Oh, yeah. So you want, you want this to roll up, return, and then return again. Yes. Okay. So we'll, we'll put one of these in over here. All right, so let's take a look at a railing that doesn't just return straight along the, 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 the stringer, but actually returns toward the end of a landing. Okay, so we're going to kind of have almost like a double return. So we're going to run up this flight, then we're going to level out, and then we're going to break and return along here. Yep. Okay. All right, now in order to do that, because that is going to be our three sections, we can't have a leveling off at the bottom without modeling that graphically. Okay. So we're going to pretend that we just run that straight on down and, and call that good. So first thing we want to do is cut that section view, again, looking at your walking line. And we'll get our construction lines in.
And these are, again, just to lay out along the center. This is going to be the center of the flange of that beam. And then we're going to come down to the landing level. We're just going to kill it right there. Okay. Now, what we're going to do here is instead of making this the main section, we want this middle piece to be the main section here. Right, because you get one return left and one return right. Correct. Okay. So we'll plug this in. Left, right. Ready, left return. And then I'm going to right-click out of the right return. I'm not going to put that right return in just yet. Okay, now just to keep this simple, we're going to leave the grab bar off too. Okay, so it's going to return at a post, and then it's just going to die at a post here. Okay. Okay. Now we click OK. And we will also have to tweak. Let's, let's take out those pickets, too. Let's just make it an empty rail. Keep it nice and simple. Anything else can be dealt with later. So now our main section is going to be at 4. And our left return is going to have that inch and three quarter. Okay. Okay, so now our rails land where they need to. We're not going to worry about post locations yet. We can deal with that later. But now we need to get that last return, our right return. So we're going to cut that section right on that line. And it's very important here that you're in the correct plane when you do this. Because if you're off, it will actually skew it at a different angle. And I can break that just to show you how that's going to work and how ugly that winds up being. We're going to run this line over, get that, and we'll run it back to there. Okay, so now we're going to edit this, and then for right end, we're going to change that to be return, and then we'll let it die with a post. Now, once you've done this, you have to go into ends, okay, and then you'll have this button, locate return for the right end. We're going to click that. We're going to pick that return. And it has to be the walk line, that bottom line. You have to be consistent. And it has to be in the plane that you want the center of that post to end up. So when I click OK. Make sure you have your Z have, filtering turned on. Yes, so make sure your Z filter is turned on. So now let's get ourselves a little rotated isometric view. You'll see that we have turned the corner. So we are running up, leveling off, and then turning the corner. Okay. And now you'll recall I said we're going to put in our posts after because that is pretty ugly. So you'll just lay this out however you normally would to locate your posts. There's generally two schools of thought. One is you put a post each side and then you put a nice little miter in there that, that can kind of turn that corner. Or not a miter... Uh, you can use a miter, uh, an elbow in there so you get that nice smooth transition. And the other is basically you put a post right on that corner and you just let the things die both into it. Obviously, the post on the corner is considerably cheaper. Okay, and now I want to put one in the main section. Beautiful. And again, you've got all the same abilities. You can set up each of these to have uh, a, you know, a plate. You can have it welded. You can have standoff connections if you put it offset. There's, there's a whole list. And I, I would encourage anyone to check these out. You know, you've got shear tabs, welded tees, continuous bottom plate, the whole, the whole gambit. There's all kinds of methods of attachment so check out what's available see what your fabricator or customer wants to use and you know go from there all right anything else in wrapping up did you want to do the one that was offset to show the what happens when they're lined up the nosings are lined up oh yeah let's do it all right, so we discussed earlier the situation that you want to fix where there are two nosing lines and they don't allow the, uh, the descending stair enough time to get down to the elevation before returning through the well and exactly how to handle that. So let's, let's go over that issue just because we know somebody somewhere is going to have to deal with it. <clears throat> okay, so 
generally the way that we like to lay this out is we're going to do the same thing where we kick over by the same center to center in order to maintain that grab bar distance off the guardrail posts. So I've got that, uh, I believe that's three, is it three and a half, three and a half. Yep. So I've got that set up. And then from there, I'm going to get my, get this in. Let's get my top of rail location. Should be two foot 10. So that is where my, my grab bar beyond is running up to when it hits that top of the nosing line. Okay, so that one is going to be fairly simple. Okay, but this one is also going to be a little bit of a trick. What we like to do is we just continue running this down the hill until it hits that point. Okay, so I'm just going to figure out what I need to do to get to there. And then I'm going to go by the uh, size of the rail beyond that. So 15 sixteenths in this case. And I'm going to take that measurement, so five and a sixteenth, and I'm going to extend that grab bar by that far. So I'm going to go into ends. That's five and a sixteenth. Okay. Now, I'm going to get in on the other side. Kind of set this one up the same way. We're going to put in our level piece here. Okay. Oops. Okay, we know that point breaks right there. run our level piece across for that. Now, something to consider in this um, is, is the ADA clearance code or uh, ADA regulations about protrusions into the walkable area. Now, for handrails, and the, the place that I go to, my go-to spot for this information generally is the uh, Wagner Guide to Handrail and Guardrail Building Codes and Standards. They do a pretty good job of presenting the standards there. Um, not only just presenting them, but giving some explanations and some kind of verbal or not verbal visual reasons to expect it. Uh, but th through that, you'll, you'll learn that the maximum that you can protrude into the walk line is four and a half inches for a rail. For other items, it's four inches, uh, but there is an exception for handrails. And that's from, again, the shoulder. Okay, now a little bit of a trick here is we need to get these two rails to join along this plane, okay? So if you type DA, that's gonna get you the modeling dimensions, you can take this quick measurement, okay? And it will stay visible in the model. Okay. And that's important, okay? So now I'm gonna cut my section view along that line and looking at the railings going down the hill, okay? That dimension stays in the plane it was cut and now I have that for quick reference. That is a okay. super cool trip. That is. So from there, I'm going to offset up from my center of that. This is the horizontal piece that I've put in. I'm going to kick up five and a quarter inches. So now I have that quick reference. And then I'm going to draw a straight line between those two intersections on the center lines of the grab rails. Okay. Now from there, and this is another little bit of economy in your motion, is I'm going to... Now run this right from those two points. And actually, I, I should back up. Hold on. Okay, so I need to draw a straight line between here and here. But as a little bit of economy in motion, I'm going to run this entirely out of the parametric. The parametric will draw the straight line. So all I have to do is pick the two points and then go to even spacing. And now I have my splice point and I have my line and my offset points. So now from here, I'm just gonna kick up 15 sixteenths for my pipe size and down 15 sixteenths here. And now I'm just gonna add these pieces in along the line from these extents. Now 
now I have ready to be spliced materials. I'm sorry, ready to be mitered materials. And you'll see that these do miter out nice. Now here's a spot I'm going to give a tip for the modelers to make your drawing editor people a lot happier. The moment you have to put one of these railings in that's rotated like that, get go into isolate and cut that end view so that they can see that rotation. Because if you don't do that, every time it's, it's very possible that when you detail that railing, it's going to look crazy and you're not going to understand what's going on. If you don't provide that section, they might not know that that portion coming off the back of that is actually sloped. And then you end up with bad shop details. And there we go. All right, all right. so I, I mean, uh, all told, we're, we're probably, uh, this is a fairly considerable video lengthwise, uh, but there was a lot to get over, and I think, you know, spending the time is probably worth it to people. You, I'm sure we got a couple good tips in there. Honestly, just the, the dimension tool tip was, was pretty cool to me. I like that. That's, that's something that we kind of run into frequently is as I'm teaching people during the day is we almost have like a everyone has a today I learned moment. Yeah. And it's not always the main thing I'm trying to teach. It could be any little quick tip of, oh, I didn't know I could add that or do that. And it, it just saves a little bit of time and it just makes their day. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. So. All right, guys, that's it for this episode of the Steel Forum. Uh, you know, a quick tip on, or uh, I can't even say quick, a, a full-on tutorial about how to do guardrails and handrails with all the considerations that detailers really have to take into place that uh, you might not get on a webinar video. So as always, we hope you enjoy the video. We hope you come back and leave those comments below. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about, apparently, in YouTube, when you click the subscribe button, just clicking it doesn't actually do much other than if you actually go to YouTube, it tells you that you've got a new video. Uh, so what you want to do is if you actually want to hear about our videos when they get posted, there is a uh, bell icon. If you press that bell icon when we post a new video, a new tutorial, or a new podcast, you will get notified so that you can uh, swing over and see it and make sure that you're not doing things the slow way. As always, we hope you see you back here on the Steel Forum.